Okay, so today um, I'm going to be talking about some experiments that I've done to try to figure out how um, this allotetraploid species, Mimulus sukensis, has small flower size. And since it's a polyploid, one of the things that I think about instead of where recombination events happen and how, um, basically where recombination events happen, but instead um, how chromosomes pair with each other. But so just for some introductory information, can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, all right, now, no? All right. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. All right, so um, polyploidy is usually the result of a whole genome duplication, um, or it is a whole genome duplication. It's usually the result of the fusion of unreduced gametes. And as eloquently noted by Dobzhansky, it usually results in new species. And sometimes it also results in novel adaptations, such as the small flower size of Mimulus sukensis, which is the species I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so in polyploids, people generally like to group things into twos where there's either autopolyploids that have um, gametes from the two species, or one species, sorry, and allopolyploids where there um, are unreduced gametes from two different species. And in allopolyploids, what's really interesting is that in meiosis, you ha usually have the chromosomes of species A pairing together and the chromosomes of species B pairing together. And if this doesn't happen, there are actually um, really important consequences, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. So the way that I like to see it, there are three mechanisms that can actually generate phenotypic variation in polyploids. And this is both variation um, between polyploids that maybe have been independently derived, and also um, between polyploids and their diploid progenitors. So the first two, ploidy effect and segregational vari variants, um, can basically be observed pretty soon after polyploid formation. So when I say ploidy effect, I just mean that immediate, immediately after polyploidization, there is a phenotypic difference um, between the polyploid and its diploid progenitors or between the polyploid and a, what you might expect to see in a diploid F1. Um, and these can be due to things like cell size differences or methylation, um, all that fun stuff. There can also be segregational variants which arises as a result of homeologous recombination, which I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. And there can also be mutational variations similar to what you might see in diploids, only now you have twice the genetic material, so it's, it's twice the fun. So, so homeologous recombination, um, I might not have to explain that that much to this crowd, but um, I'm going to anyway. So, Basically, on the left, you have species A and species B, and if chromosomes of species A always pair, if you have a recombination event between them, nothing happens. You don't really generate any new genetic variation, and that's kind of boring. All of your polyploids all look the same. You can only accumulate variation through mutation. If, on the other hand, you have homeologous pairing, you get these novel, you get novel heritable variation. And this is really cool because it's actually been demonstrated in synthetic brassica, uh, polyploids and naturally occurring cotton and tragopogon uh, allopolyploids. So I want to know if I can find this in Mimulus. So what's actually also nice about this is that homeologous recombination will result in a signal that you can see when you do whole genome ge sequencing. In other words, in this region there will be no SNPs, and in that region you'll infer it's a large chunk that there's been a homeologous recombination event. So this is a system that I'm going to be using to basically figure out how these, um, which of these mechanisms are involved in um, the evolution of flower size. And um, so we have Mimulus sukensis, which is the naturally occurring allotetraploid, and its diploid progenitors, Mimulus gutatus, which is quite large flowered and outcrossing, and Mimulus nasutus, which is small flowered and selfing. And then we have the diploid F1, which is somewhat intermediate, but it tends more towards gutatus in flower size. Mimulus sukensis, on the other hand, um, hopefully you've noticed from this, looks exceedingly similar to its selfing progenitor, Mimulus nasutus. Um, so then it, it begs the question, how do you get from this diploid F1 to this small flowered um, Mimulus sukensis? So what I know thus far is that it's a geographically widespread polyploid lineage that's um, been found in the valleys of western Oregon and also on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. It resembles Nasutus, as I just showed you. They're phenotypically distinct from diploid F1s, and sequence data from six nuclear genes um, suggests that there have been many independent origins of this 
species. So the question is, what is the genetic basis of flower size and what mechanisms drove this evolution? So flower size is an ecologically important trait that contributes to reproductive isolation and fitness. Just thought I should mention that so you know that I'm just not picking a random trait, um, although it is one of the only traits that I can measure, but it's nice that it's important. Um, <laughs> so um, the basic question is, 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 did homeologous recombination allow for rapid phenotypic evolution, um, or is it sort of more small-scale variation? So I can get at these three um, mechanisms by um, basically a number of experience. I can experiments. I can look at synthetic allotetraploids, both at their phenotype and um, look for segregational variants. I can also look at whole genome sequence data from natural allotetraploids to look for homeologous recombination in those large chunks that I just talked about. And then finally, I can get right to the question and do QTL mapping, finally. Um, so if I want to ask um, if there's uh, basically if homeologous recombination is causing this phenotypic variation, I'm going to be talking about whole genome sequence data. And this is basically in data from two individuals of Sukensis and comparing them to their diploid progenitors. And I can also, even though I'm not really going to talk about this a lot, um, I can also answer the question of whether or not there's homeologous recombination by looking at synthetic allotetraploids. So in other words, approaching it from a um, perspective of something that's been around a long time versus something that's just been created. So what do I expect to see in my whole genome sequence data? Basically, if there's been no homeologous recombination, I expect to see that the tetraploid looks exactly like a diploid F1. If there has been, there should be these chunks where there's SNP density, in other words, where there's no SNPs, where it, it drops to zero, and these should be large, large regions. So when I look at um, my tetraploid, so the, the chartreuse is actually the tetraploid and the, the pink is actually um, um, comparing the two diploid progenitors, you see at the ends of the chromosomes on this particular chromosome, which are gene rich, that there's similar levels of SNP de density in the tetraploid when comparing the two genomes within the tetraploid to the two genomes of the diploid progenitors. So, and all my chromosomes look like this um, across the two individuals. So this suggests that there's not any evidence of historical homeologous recombination in these two samples. Um, I did find one thing that was really interesting that I, I really want to talk about today just briefly. So I found one region um, that is basically represents a divergent haplotype. It's shared among all Mimula sukensis, and there's one interesting gene in there that's involved in the suppression of homeologous recombination and affects fertility in barley, I think. It's MSH7, which is a plant-specific mismatch repair protein. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by this, um, but I'm not going to talk a lot more about it today. But anyway, it's interesting. Um, so what did I learn from that? Basically, the whole genome sequence data told me that the phenotype is not likely to be caused by homeologous recombination. And I'm still left with the question is, what, are the, what is the genetic basis of flower size in sukensis? So what I did from there is I actually, luckily, well, I haven't really told you this part, but um, the synthetic tetraploids are actually very large. They look like a large diploid F1. So it's even more convincing that there must have been some sort of evolution to get to this small flower size. So I took a large flowered synthetic tetraploid and crossed it to a natural small flowered tetraploid, self the F1, and created an F2 mapping population that I, that I then measured for floral traits. And so, <clears throat> This may seem pretty elementary, but I was actually really surprised, or not surprised, but happy to see this graph because basically what it's showing is that my F2 population has more variation than the F1 population, um, indicating, and there's a, a positive heritability, indicating that um, there is actually a genetic basis to the flower size difference between these two things. Um, and the reason why I was so excited about this is that if you grow up a whole population of synthetic allotetraploids, you don't see this. Um, so you could phenotype thousands of individuals that are exactly identical. Um, so this is nice. Um, there's a, a significant difference between the two parents, and there's a genetic basis to this trait. And for the rest of the talk, even though I measured seven floral traits, I'm going to be talking about um, PC1 because all of the floral traits are actually highly correlated. And um, this principal component encompasses 86% of the variation, and most of the traits are pretty highly loaded. Um, 
eventually I'm going to look at all the traits individually, but uh, for now we'll just simplify things. So now that I've phenotyped all of those F2 individuals, I'm, basically what I've done is I've done QTL mapping via the multiplex shotgun genotyping approach, similar to what Nadia talked about yesterday. The basic premise is that you lightly sequence all of your F2 individuals. In this case, I had 476 F2 individuals plus two of each parent. And in each F2, I just want to remind you that I'm keeping track of four possible haplotypes. Um, in other words, so the natural tetraploid is, is contributing both a gutatus and a nasutus, and so is the synthetic. And any four of these can be in any um, given tetraploid. And I'm also sort of, I have this slight expectation that I expect the gutatus chromosomes to pair and then the pseudus chromosomes to pair. And if they don't pair, that's, that's actually evidence of, that's homeologous recombination and homeologous pairing. Um, so after I got back my data and um, was very happy to discover that it actually seemed like it was going to be us usable, I aligned my reads to the diploid genome and parsed them by barcode. Then I verified my SNPs using the parental sam samples, which was actually pretty key um, because some of my SNPs turned out to be not so great. Um, and then I called genotypes in two megabase bins. And so the reason why I did this instead of using markers is that it's not a diploid, it's not a um, binary, either you are this or you are that. It's you might have this allele and then you might, if you don't have that, you could be three other things. Um, so it's not a binary decision and so doing it in two megabase bins was, was the best that I could come up with, basically the smallest bin size that still made my parental samples look normal. Um, so then I took each bin and I had 149 of them and I used each bin as a marker in QTL analysis and basically I did a separate linear regression of each genotype bin combination on PC1 of the floral traits. Um, but before I get into that, um, there's something really interesting about this cross and that is that even though when I look at natural tetraploids, I don't observe any evidence of homeologous recombination and when I look at synthetic tetraploids, I don't observe any evidence of homeologous recombination. If I look in this cross, I do actually <laughs> observe evidence of homeologous recombination. Um, and so basically that's a count and there was 476 individuals, so the, the max is 160 and you can see that's a pretty, to me that's a pretty high frequency. Um, so basically what I did is ha I have these 10 megabase bins and then I just asked which proportion is it most similar to. And um, you can see that it varies across the genome and if you were to have a metric of SNP density and you try to make an association between the frequency and the, um, of homeologous recombination and SNP density, you would find that they were inversely related, which is sort of interesting, um, which suggests that the fewer SNPs there are, basically the less fidelity there is in pairing. And so I'm still not convinced that, may, that this is a real pattern. I'm actually fearful that um, the, in these regions where there's low SNP density, there's also the highest probability that the assignment is incorrect. But given it's a 10 megabase region, I feel like maybe that's a little bit overly cautious. But anyway, I'm just going to put that out there. So there are three highly significant QTLs. Um, and possibly many more of small effect. Um, and so this is just a cartoon, but basically um, the, um, there's one on uh, chromosome 3, chromosome 7, and chromosome 10. And um, so basically what you end up happening is the synthetic component of gutatus is increasing flower size, and the natural component of nasutus is increasing flower size, and the natural component of gutatus from the natural tetraploid um, also tended to decrease flower size, but it wasn't always significant, that's why it's in gray. And um, the synthetic component of Nasutis also, um, well, it, it increased flower size relative to Nasutis, but it, um, it wasn't always, always um, what's the word, significant. Um, so that's basically what I found, and these three regions are actually sort of interesting. Um, so LG3 and LG7 are actually two of the regions with the highest incidence of homeologous recombination. So the two tallest peaks are basically where those, those QTLs are. And then finally LG10 is actually 
the place of an inversion between the two parental lines used to create the synthetic tetraploid. So the, to create the synthetic tetraploid, there's the nasutus synthetic and gutatus synthetic, and between those lines, there's an inversion. And that inversion has a flower size QTL in it. Um, and this is work done by Leela Fishman. That she, she demonstrated that. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, OK, so what have I shown you thus far? Basically, um, I didn't really discuss this a lot. Um, but it, hopefully it was a little bit obvious to you that um, even though there may be a ploidy effect, it's not really in the right direction. Basically, these large um, tetraploids look nothing like what occurs naturally. Um, so they're phenotypically similar to diploid F1s and mimulus gutatus. Um, so there's no ploidy effect causing the evolution of flower size to be small. Um, and also, I found no evidence of segregational, vari var ugh, segregational variance. So in other words, if you look at the whole genome sequence of two mimulus sukensis individuals, um, you see that they're fixed heterozygous throughout their whole genome, um, suggesting that there hasn't been any recombination of homeologous recombination events in those individuals. Um, and also, if you look at synthetic allotetraploids in an F2 population that should, in theory, um, be segregating, you don't see any segregation. All of the F2 individuals look identical, suggesting that there is no homeologous recombination. And finally, um, so there's a few large QTLs, um, which are, are sort of interesting. And it appears that maybe both subgenomes of the natural tetraploid may contribute to the small flower size. So this is all exciting. And where I'm going to go from here is that I'd like to confirm these at least these large QTLs using microsatellite markers. And I should ac actually say that when I say large, I actually mean like 5% of the, um, the total phenotypic variation, which isn't, isn't huge. Um, but it is for flower size, um, which is a highly quantitative trait. Um, so next, I also have a second F2 map mapping population where I've done the same thing and I've already phenotyped them. And there's, you know, I could always um, do the whole genotyping thing over again, or I could just um, try to confirm these QTLs using uh, microsatellite markers. And then there's that interesting region that I talked about um, that I'd like to explore more. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone, including Mohammed, for arranging all of this. That's it.